So thank you all for coming uh, and thank you uh, to Biolinks for allowing us to run these courses. Um, so I'm going to spend a bit of time this afternoon talking about um, Charles Darwin uh, and some of the um, experiments that he did um, and observations he made looking at earthworms. Um, Darwin himself realised, uh, although he loved earthworms, he realised that they are not the most um, charismatic animals, let's say, um, and not the most popular. So I think uh, he would be really impressed that we've now got over 100 people um, watching this presentation. Um, so I'm going to um, kind of go through a few introductions, um, tell you a little bit about uh, me and how I got into earthworms, um, the Earthworm Society of Britain, uh, and then also um, just tell you kind of what earthworms are. Um, I'll then go through the um, history of earthworm science and kind of what was known about earthworms, um, like kind of pre-Darwin, um, a little bit about Charles Darwin himself uh, and some of the experiments that he did. Um, so he did things looking at um, leaves and paper triangles and how um, worms pull those into their burrows. Um, he also did lots of experiments looking at how they bury stones. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, and then he published a book um, all about earthworms uh, and those experiments that he'd done. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Darwin's worm stone, um, which you can go and see a replica of um, at Down House, where he used to live. Uh, and then we'll finish up with some questions and hopefully some answers. Uh, so uh, my name's Kerry Calloway. Uh, I'm an earthworm recorder um, for the Earthworm Society of Britain. Uh, I'm also the secretary um, and I uh, run earthworm courses, um, usually for the Earthworm Society and also for the Biolinks project. Um, so I'm kind of more used to standing up in a classroom um, or being out in the field, um, teaching people how to sample for earthworms uh, and then how to identify them with microscopes. Um, I'm also working on a project uh, with Kieran um, where we're photographing um, kind of really detailed um, macro pictures of earthworms um, to hopefully build up a um, kind of reference um, library um, to help with identification to species. Uh, and then I also um, work and volunteer at the Natural History Museum um, and I'm working on the earthworm collections there um, databasing them um, because surprisingly they don't know exactly what specimens they have um, but also gathering all of the location data um, from those specimens uh, and ultimately that will then be entered into the National Earthworm Recording Scheme so that we have some good historical data. Um, so the Earthworm Society of Britain uh, is a small uh, natural history um, organisation it was set up in 2009, so it's relatively um, young compared to some other natural history societies. Um, it's completely volunteer led um, and the aim is to further the understanding of earthworms in Britain. Um, so as I said earlier, we run courses, um, we're teaching people and training them how to become recorders uh, and then we run the National Earthworm Recording Scheme. Um, and we're ultimately uh, trying to build up enough um, recorders and enough records to be able to um, create distribution maps um, of um, the different species of earthworm that we have in Britain. Um, so what is an earthworm? Uh, so hopefully everyone here has seen an earthworm before uh, and vaguely knows what they are. Um, it's actually a slightly um, confusing name. It's not a biological scientific term, earthworm. Um, it's just a common name that's given to the um, biggest animals in the class Oligochaeta, uh, which is in the phylum annelids or annelida. Uh, so annelids are long segmented worm-like things. Uh, it includes uh, earthworms, uh, also includes other terrestrial um, and freshwater aquatic worms. Um, it also includes uh, polychaetes, um, so these are uh, marine worms that often live very deep down in the oceans, uh, and leeches as well. Um, in the UK, there are 31 uh, species of earthworm. Um, to identify them, you uh, need to um, collect a specimen and then look at it down a microscope. So uh, we're not going to talk about uh, any identification today, um, but they do broadly fit into uh, three or four, depending on who you speak to, um, ecological groups. Uh, and Kieran's talk next Thursday um, will be all about those groups. Um, and how you can identify um, earthworms in the field into those groups. 
Um, they're found in a range of habitats. Um, generally, they're found in the habitat kind of of the thing that they eat. Uh, so you'll find them in soil, you find uh, other groups in leaf litter, dead wood, dung, compost, um, and they're generally eating um, the thing that they're living in. Uh, so um, I kind of want to just go through a little bit of the history of earthworm science um, to kind of um, allow you to realise what we do and don't know about them uh, and um, at what Charles Darwin um, would have known about them when he first started. Um, so over 2000 years ago, um, Aristotle, uh, who's kind of like the first biologist in the world, uh, he said that earthworms are the intestines of the earth. Um, I don't know how he knew that. Um, I don't know if he did any research on them, um, but he, he did say that. So even, even that long ago, people knew how important earthworms are for our soils. Uh, in 1758, um, Linnaeus, who was a Swedish um, biologist, um, he came up with a classification system for naming species. Um, so when you hear um, the scientific or the Latin name um, of a species, um, it always comes in two parts. And so like people are Homo sapiens. Um, Linnaeus is the one who came up with that um, system of naming things. Um, and as he was doing that, he named hundreds and hundreds of different species, um, all sorts of different animals from all different groups. Um, but one of those was Lumbricus terrestris, uh, which is the common earthworm, um, although actually it's not that common. Um, it's a species that we have in the UK, and it's actually the biggest species um, around here. Uh, and then in 1777, um, Gilbert White, um, wrote a book uh, called The Natural History of Selborne. Uh, and so he, li he lived in um, the village of Selborne, which is in Hampshire. Uh, and he basically spent lots of time looking in his um, garden and around the village and just observing wildlife and observing nature. And he wrote lots and lots of letters um, about his observations that he sent to um, various people uh, and they were then turned into a book. Um, he realised earthworms were important uh, and the quote on the screen um, says, uh, though in appearance a small and despicable link in the chain of nature, yet if lost would make a lamentable chasm. So he realised they were really important, but he didn't really do, um, he didn't really make many observations, didn't really do much studying of earthworms. Um, but he did also say that a good monography of worms would afford much entertainment and information and would open a large and new field in natural history. So he was kind of encouraging somebody else to um, come along and really study earthworms uh, and write a whole book about them. Uh, unfortunately, no one did for over 100 years, uh, and it was actually Charles Darwin who was the first to, to write a book all about earthworms. Uh, and then later on, uh, Savigny, who was a um, French um, zoologist, he described um, a lot more uh, European species. Um, and actually 13 of those species um, are now, or live in the, are found in the UK. Um, but at the time, um, it wouldn't have been known that those species were living in the UK, um, but they were, they probably were, uh, and they were described. Uh, so then along came um, Charles Darwin. Uh, he was born in Shrewsbury uh, in 1809. Uh, he went off uh, to university in Edinburgh to study medicine initially, didn't really like that, uh, and then went to Cambridge to study natural theology. Uh, and whilst he was there, he became um, good friends with uh, Professor Henslow, who was a kind of very important uh, botanist at the time. Uh, and he recommended um, that Charles Darwin should go on uh, the voyage of the Beagle. Um, which was um, a voyage that was going uh, to South America to map the coastline. Uh, and they were looking for a natural historian and a geologist um, and kind of an educated gentleman to, to go on the ship um, and observe natural history in South America. So he set sail on a uh, voyage at Beagle in 1831. They were meant to only go for a couple of years. Uh, they ended up being away from home for five years. Uh, and obviously that voyage is, um, or in Darwin, uh, a famous kind of link to the Galapagos Islands. Um, and they did obviously spend time there, but they also spent a lot of time um, going up and down um, the east and the west coast of South America, 
and then also actually all the way around the world. Um, so it's not just the Galapagos, it's not just South America that that voyage went to, it did go all the way around the world. Uh, he arrived home in 1836 um, and then published his first paper on earthworms uh, just a year later, so in 1837. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, in, a, in a bit about what was included in that paper and, and how it was received. Um, in 1838, um, he first came up with his theory of natural selection um, and he realised that it was going to be quite controversial and that he needed uh, lots of evidence to back it up. So he kind of kept quiet, uh, didn't really do too much about it, was do doing lots of work in the background um, but not publishing at that time. Um, he married uh, his cousin uh, in 1839 uh, and then the two of them moved to Down House, uh, which is in Kent. Uh, in 1842 uh, and Down House is a museum um, to Charles Darwin um, which I suspect they're not open right now but you can go and visit um, usually and it's a whole museum dedicated to him and his work um, and he did lots of research there in the gardens of Down House uh, lots of his earthworm experiments which I'll talk about later um, were done in the garden there. Uh, then in 1859 he published On the Origin of Species, so that's his kind of most famous book, um, all about um, his theory of evolution by natural selection. Uh, in 1881, so uh, 30 years later, he um, published uh, The Formation of Vegetable Mould Through the Action of Worms, which is his book all about um, earthworms, the one that Gilbert White had called for to be written uh, more than 100 years ago, or 100 years before. And then uh, just the year after, um, he died uh, and was buried in Westminster Abbey. Um, so that paper, um, the, in 1837, um, he published the first paper uh, on um, the formation of mould, um, so basically um, earthworms. Uh, and when he's talking about the formation of mould, uh, he's talking about the formation of soil, basically. Um, so he'd just returned from the Beagle uh, and he went to visit his uncle um, Josiah Wedgwood who's in the picture um, and he lived in Staffordshire. So he went to visit him uh, and his uncle showed him some fields um, where the farmers had spread um, lime which is like a fertiliser on the surface of the field um, several years before and the field hadn't been ploughed um, soil hadn't really been disturbed but somehow this lime wasn't on the surface anymore and it was buried uh, three inches below the soil. So the two of them kind of wondering what's going on. And obviously farmers for a long time had known that this happened, they'd known that when they spread things on the, on the surface, it will sink down. Um, but they'd put it down to just, just the substance itself working its way through the soil. Um, but Darwin thought about it and he was like, well, how does powdered lime work its way through uh, quite dense soil. It, there must be something else making it happen, it's not just sinking on its own. Uh, and so he started, it was actually his uncle who um, suggested it could be um, earthworms and it could be their digestive processes that are kind of churning this soil um, and causing the substances to sink down. And Darwin also observed that there were lots of earthworm casts, um, so it's kind of earthworm poo um, on the surface. So it was like, well, if they're eating soil from below and then bringing it up to the surface, they're kind of ploughing plowing the field. And that's maybe what's making um, the lime sink down. So Darwin wrote a scientific paper on this, uh, presented it to the Geological Society in 1837 uh, and was basically um, ridiculed. And they didn't, uh, it wasn't kind of accepted that earthworms could be having such a big effect uh, on soils. Um, Earthworms are seen as very lowly, uh, simple creatures, uh, and people couldn't understand how, how they're having such a big effect. Uh, so Darwin um, kind of did what he did with his theory of evolution and kept quiet, went away and gathered lots of evidence, did lots of research to find out and to prove that this is what was happening. Um, so why earthworms and Darwin? Um, Obviously, I haven't been able to ask him myself uh, why he studied earthworms and why he liked them. Um, but I've, so I've kind of thought of a few reasons uh, why I like to study them and why the Earthworm Society um, are interested in them. Uh, and then also some things that I know from research on him. So I think the first thing to say is that 
Darwin studied earthworms for 44 years, but he didn't only study earthworms. He studied all sorts of um, natural things. Uh, and he, he wrote a whole book on earthworms, obviously, but he also wrote books on um, plants, volcanoes, uh, orchids, uh, corals, barnacles, um, all sorts of things. Um, so earthworms were just kind of one thing that he studied. Um, they're obviously ecologically important. Uh, and Darwin realised that, and obviously Aristotle and Gilbert White and everyone before had also realised it, so that's the kind of um, big reason to study them. Uh, and Darwin suspected that they might have some uh, intelligence, um, and he was very interested in that. He actually wrote in his book, uh, I became interested in them and wished to learn how far they acted consciously and how much mental power they displayed. Uh, so I think he kind of really liked the idea of being able to prove that um, such a lowly, unorganised creature um, actually had some intelligence and some consciousness. Um, they're also really common and widely distributed. So um, whilst you have to actively go and look for a worm, you have to kind of dig or look under things, it's not just going to fly past you. Um, they are common and they are easy to find. Uh, and he um, could travel around the country and he also had family all over the country who were um, doing some of his work for him um, and making observations themselves on earthworms and then and then sending the results to him. Um, and they're easy to study from home. So after um, his voyage on the Beagle, um, he Darwin suffered from ill health for most of the rest of his life. Um, and so the fact that you can study earthworms in the garden at home, you don't have to travel far for them, um, I think was probably a, a bonus for him. And he also did lots of experiments, keeping them in pots inside the house. So on days when he was feeling really ill, um, he didn't even have to go outside. He could continue his studies inside. And there's also some kind of obvious links to geology um, with earthworms um, kind of creating soils and being so important in soil formation. Um, and Darwin himself was um, kind of seen at the time, and particularly earlier on in his career, as a geologist. Um, he'd collected lots of geological samples on the Beagle uh, and he was in touch with um, famous uh, geologists at the time, such as Charles Lyell. Um, so I think that kind of earthworm soil geology link is probably also interesting to him. Uh, so some of the experiments that he did, um, he looked into uh, investigating earthworm senses uh, and was particularly interested in whether they can hear. And so he had his pots of earthworms in his house uh, and he played lots of different musical instruments to them um, and to see if they would respond. Uh, and basically none of them did. Um, so he concluded that earthworms don't hear. However, when he then put uh, pots of worms onto, on top of a piano, so rather than just being kind of near it, actually on top of the piano and played, um, they instantly retreated into their burrows. Uh, and so that Kind of made him think whilst they're maybe not picking up vibrations through the air they're picking up vibrations that are traveling through the soil or through solid objects uh, and he had heard um, that earthworms uh, will um, come to the su surface um, because they think that moles are underground um, and a mole is a predator of an earthworm uh, so the earthworm is in the ground thinks the mole's coming through comes up to the surface um, this little phenomenon has been um, utilised in very serious sport of worm charming. Um, there is a World Worm Charming Championships every year held in Cheshire. Uh, and basically you have um, an area, you give each um, team or competitor um, a set, size, set sized kind of square. Uh, and then the competition is to see who can get the most earthworms out of the ground in a set time. I think it's usually half an hour. Um, you're not allowed to dig and you're not allowed to apply any chemicals. So it's all about getting those vibrations into the ground uh, and making the worms come up to the surface. Um, it's a great day out. I have been <laughs> and I highly recommend it. Uh, I think they're usually held in June, so it probably didn't happen this year, but fingers crossed for next year's one. Um, there is another theory. So Darwin wrote about um, the moles in the ground and earthworms thinking it's a mole coming to the surface. Um, but more recently, it's been suggested that they might also be reacting to um, rain, so that they think that the vibrations are caused by raindrops um, falling on the ground. Uh, and earthworms um, breathe through their skin, 
so they if they dry out it can be they need to be moist to be able to breathe if they dry out um, it can be quite dangerous for them so uh, when it's raining um, it's much safer for them to come to the surface um, to gather food uh, or to move around uh, so there is a theory that they're coming to surface uh, with the vibrations because they think it's rain and then they can move around easily um, so Kieran will probably talk about this a bit more um, in his um, Ecology of Earthworms talk next week. Um, but some groups of earthworms uh, make uh, burrows in the ground uh, and then they um, plug those burrows. So the picture on the right shows um, the entrance to an earthworm burrow um, and that's kind of a tunnel that's going down into the ground vertically uh, and then the earthworm will feed in there. Uh, it will drag food inside uh, and it will live in there as well. Uh, and they plug the um, mouths of these burrows um, with twi twigs and leaves and things that they can find to help cover it up. Uh, and Darwin um, kind of hypothesized that um, there were three reasons why they might be doing this. Um, it could be to keep water out and to stop the burrow flooding. It could be to hide from predators. Uh, it could be to keep out cold air. Uh, and he, his favorite hypothesis was the cold air one. Um, because when he'd had his earthworms in his house, in their pots, um, he'd realised that they weren't as good at, at um, plugging their burrows and protecting them. They were a bit kind of lazy, what they did. Uh, and so he, he figured that that was because the air was warmer inside. Um, so the main reason for plugging the burrows outside is because they're cold. cold. Um, he did lots of experiments in his um, garden looking at those burrows uh, and looking at how the earthworms um, drag uh, leaves and things into those burrows to plug them uh, and in what kind of way they pull those leaves in. Um, so he, he basically went out into his garden and he pulled out 227 leaves um, out that had been pulled into burrows. He pulled them out uh, and he recorded um, whether they had been uh, dragged into the burrow by the tip of the leaf uh, by the base or the stalk of the leaf um, or by the middle uh, and he found um, that over 80 percent of them uh, had been pulled in by the tip um, so earthworms uh, aren't pulling the leaves into the burrows by chance um, they are targeting the tip of the leaf and pulling it in that way uh, and that's because it's more effective um, at kind of plugging up the entrance to the burrow by pulling it in by the tip um, so the tip will come down and then the leaf will kind of curl round and close the burrow quite nicely. Um, he was also really interested in, so that those leaves were all from native um, British plants and he was interested um, to see how earthworms would respond to non-native plants because obviously they hadn't evolved with those plants. Um, so was it kind of something that they'd evolved to do? or was it some sort of behaviour that could be, um, was flexible and could be adapted. Uh, so he also um, did experiments uh, looking at earthworm burrows and rhododendron leaves. Um, so that's the green leaf uh, photo at the bottom. And obviously that's quite a different shape to the other leaves he'd been looking at. Um, and it's actually more efficient to pull that shaped leaf into the burrow by the stalk um, because then it will kind of curl round. Uh, and so when he looked at those he found that earthworms were doing that. Um, they were kind of changing their behaviour from, uh, from the previous leaves where they were always going, or most of the time, going for the tip. Uh, and with the rhododendron leaves, they were going for the base. Uh, so this led him on to do some other experiments uh, using paper triangles. Uh, and so these are kind of mimicking leaves. Uh, and he made um, hundreds of these paper triangles um, of different sizes. Uh, and he hypothesized that um, an earthworm basically had one of three options. There were three ways that they could pull these triangles into the burrow. Um, they could use one of the three edges, they could use one of the three corners, um, or they could use the flat surface. Uh, so he then um, drew lines across the triangles to divide them into three sections. So you've got a tip section, a middle section and a base section. And he um, hypothesized that if they're using the edge to drag the triangle into the burrow, then you would expect them to um, more often drag the triangle in by the base because that's got a bigger edge. 
Uh, same for the corners, because um, the base has got two corners in it, uh, whereas the middle section hasn't got any and the top section uh, has got one. Uh, and if these are in the flat surface, again, you'd expect them to uh, more often use the base just because it's got a bigger surface. Um, but when he then laid out all of these paper triangles, um, so he found an area in his garden um, that had lots of burrows. He took all of the leaves and things that were already plugging the burrows away. He removed all of the um, leaves that were on the ground and anything else that the earthworms might use to plug the burrows and then covered the area in these paper triangles. Uh, and left them for a couple of nights uh, to see which, uh, how they dragged them in. Uh, and he found that the tip um, was uh, the more, more commonly dragged in. Uh, so again, if it was chance, uh, you would expect the, the base to be the most common because that had the bigger kind of surface area and the bigger edges. Um, but actually the tip was being dragged in. Um, so again, this kind of suggested that earthworms knew what they were doing. They knew the best way to drag these drag these triangles into their, um, into their burrows. Um, so he then started to wonder why, why were they doing this? Um, how were they doing it? Uh, is it trial and error? Um, but in all his observations, he said that he'd never seen them um, using trial and error. He'd never seen them kind of starting to drag it and then use something else. They seemed to somehow go to the tip and, and drag the tip towards the burrow. Uh, and so he uh, ended up um, concluding from these that worms, although standing low in the scale of organisation, possess some degree of intelligence. He admits that most people will find that very improbable, um, but he says that these lowly unorganised creatures uh, do actually have some intelligence. Um, these experiments are also um, one of the first examples of um, scientific experiments being done that had a kind of statistical component. Um, statistics as a discipline didn't exist at the time uh, and so the fact that he was repeating these experiments uh, and laying out hundreds of triangles um, rather than just making kind of one or two observations um, was kind of the first example of quite rigorous um, kind of repeatable scientific method. Um, so um, earthworms, as I said, they obviously live in their burrows uh, and why is this important for soil? Um, so the burrows um, are really good for soil because they help with decompaction. Uh, so they create lots of little spaces in the soil uh, and that allows um, space for plant roots to grow. And obviously if plants can grow well, then you're going to have a, a good soil and a good ecosystem. Uh, the space also create, is created um, and gives space for microorganisms and fungi so they can get in, they can further uh, break down the soil and release more nutrients. Uh, it helps to aerate the soil so oxygen can get into it and it helps with drainage and um, so if you've got really compacted soil when it rains the water just sits on top and causes a flood. Uh, if you've got nice aerate, um, soil with lots of gaps, lots of um, burrows then the water can kind of gradually drain through. Um, so earthworms also cast on top of the soil um, so going back to kind of how things might be buried. Uh, and an earthworm cast, uh, shown in the picture, um, it's basically an earthworm poo, um, but it's really good um, nutrient rich soil and kind of works as a natural fertiliser. And so they produce these on top of the, um, on the surface, um, and then gradually um, as they get kind of weathered down, um, they spread out evenly across the field. Uh, so Darwin uh, also looked a lot at how stones sink um, and he went to um, his, one of his um, relatives homes in Leith Hill uh, which is in Surrey I think um, and he looked at how there were um, some big uh, stones that had been left there and um, so 35 years before uh, an old uh, lime kiln had been pulled down uh, and two of these really big stones from the kiln had just been left on the site. Um, and so he met an old workman uh, who took him back to the exact site and showed him the stains and they hadn't been moved in 35 years. Um, and the workman described how when they'd first been left there, the ground had been bare uh, and obviously this, the stones were just left on the surface. Um, but now 35 years later, the stones were actually buried, um, not buried, but sunken into the soil by a couple of inches. Um, 
But Darwin also realised that the uh, ground immediately around the stones wasn't completely flat, it kind of rose up towards the edge of the stone. Um, so you can see that in the diagram, um, figure six at the bottom, uh, where the, um, the surface and the grass is kind of sloping up towards the stone. Uh, and this is because when you put a big stone on the ground, the earthworms that are underneath it uh, will try to come to the surface and cast, but they can't get to the surface because the stone's there. So then they go out to the edge uh, and cast where they can around the edge. So they're kind of doing their poos around the edge of the stone. Uh, and this obviously causes um, the ground around the edge of the stone over time to, to raise up. Uh, and he found in um, Leith Hill Place that th with this stone, uh, there was actually four inches um, had raised up next to the stone, um, in addition to the two inches that the stone had sunk as well. Uh, and from that he concluded that it would take around 250 years um, for the stone to kind of be completely level with the ground. Um, and he started to realise that this could have um, implications for uh, builders and surveyors and civil engineers who are kind of laying out big stones as um, for measuring things um, and measuring the land and if the stones are moving around um, then that's going to have implications for their measurements. Uh, he also looked at uh, stones uh, at Stonehenge and how they're sinking over time uh, and particularly uh, some of the um, stones that are not the kind of standing up for ones but some of them that have fallen over so in the picture on the right you can see that there were some laid down uh, and he went and dug holes or actually got his son to go and dig holes um, next to those uh, and found that um, some of these are sunken um, 10 inches um, down below the surface. Um, another thing that he was interested in is so whilst these stones are sinking how much earth is actually being brought up to the surface uh, and so he got one of his nieces um, who lived at Leith Hill um, to go and collect all of the earthworm casts uh, that were cast on the surface um, in a year uh, in a, a square, in two square yards, two separate square yards. Uh, so they picked one site um, in the garden um, at Leith Hill Place uh, and then one site kind of on common land nearby. Uh, I'm not quite sure how he persuaded her to do this. Um, but she went out, not quite every day, but most days for a whole year and collected all of the casts. Um, they collected all that soil uh, and then they dried it and weighed it. Uh, and in the garden, uh, they had 1.6 kilograms worth of soil uh, from one square yard, um, which equates to over seven and a half tonnes per acre. So earthworms uh, in that acre bringing up seven and a half tons of soil to the surface a year. Um, on the common land um, did the same thing and there they found 3.4 kilograms uh, which is over 16 tons per acre. So it's a lot of soil being brought to the surface. Uh, he then wanted to see, so okay you've got all these all these casts and all this soil but actually uh, if we spread that over a whole acre, how thick is that layer of soil? Um, so he um, took into account the fact that the soil had been dried, um, so actually when it's wet and when it's um, in situ it would be uh, much thicker, uh, but also compaction. Um, so he took those into account uh, and found that uh, in the garden square, um, 0 0.1 inches um, per year of soil would be brought to the surface which doesn't sound like much but actually that's an inch in 10 years uh, and 10 years is not very long uh, in the grand scheme of things of uh, big rocks and stonehenge being buried and things uh, and on the common land uh, it was one and a half inches in 10 years um, so earthworms are having a really big effect um, on bringing earth to the surface um, so all of those experiments uh, and many many more that I haven't talked about uh, he wrote up all of the results from them um, and published those in a book uh, called, well, with a very catchy title of The Formation of Vegetable Mould Through the Action of Worms with Observations on the Habits. Uh, and this was published in 1881, so he'd, uh, 44 years after that first um, paper um, where he'd looked at um, the lime sinking through the field with his uncle. Um, he'd spent 44 years doing earthworm experiments and others. Um, 
he didn't think that the um, book would be very popular uh, and he actually wrote to the publisher um, before before he sent um, the draft to the pub publisher and he said here is a work which has occupied me for many years and interested me much I fear the subject will not interest the public but will you publish it for me uh, the publisher did publish it uh, and it actually was the best-selling book uh, of, that Darwin wrote whilst he was alive um, so it went through six editions in the first year sold three and a half thousand copies in the first two months um, so I think he was very surprised um, that it was that successful um, and at the time that was more copies than the origin of species which is now kind of what he's famous for um, it was also seen as a really uh, important book. Um, it's kind of it's the first book. Um, it's all about earthworms, um, certainly in the English language, uh, and it's really contributed um, to lots of different um, fields of biology. Um, so, including invertebrate ecology, geology, behavioural ecology. So, they're quite different fields, um, but it's seen as a kind of very useful, very important book. Uh, so, finally, I'll talk about Darwin's uh, wormstone. Um, so, if you if you Google Darwin and worms, um, pretty quickly you come up with a picture of this picture. Um, and this is um, Darwin's worm stone. Uh, this is a replica of it, um, which is in um, the land just around Down House. You can go and visit it, uh, where Darwin used to live. Um, and it's basically a, a measuring de device and stone that um, Darwin and his son Horace um, kind of invented together. Uh, and made to really accurately measure um, how stones are sinking um, into the ground through time. So you've got this kind of uh, millstone on the ground, a big flat stone, uh, and through the middle of it you've got these two rods that are poking up. Uh, and they actually go deep down into the ground, and it's a couple of metres down, um, to the bottom of the soil layer and are sitting on the clay layer. Uh, and so then as the stone sinks through the soil over time, and um, because of the action of worms, uh, you can accurately measure um, the position of the stone relative to the position at uh, the top of those rods and see how much it's sunk. Uh, and then the diagram on the left uh, is the device that you can use to, to make those measurements. Um, so Charles's son Horace um, invented this um, and they positioned this worm stone uh, in the garden at Down House uh, in 1877. Um, and we're taking measurements um, quite regularly, um, at least a few times a year, um, to see how this was changing. Um, and this is going to help um, advise, Horace was a civil engineer, um, so he was hoping that this would kind of inform um, the accuracy of some of those stones that they were using to, to measure things. Um, they did realise that other factors would affect it. Um, so if you've got tree roots that grow underneath the stone, obviously that's going to affect its um, movements. Um, the expansion of the rods with temperature could, could alter the results uh, and also the moisture content in the soil um, could alter the kind of speed at which the stone is sinking. Um, the results, so they kept this study going for 17 years. Um, so actually um, Charles Darwin died only five years into this experiment, um, but Horace kept the study going for 17 years um, and he found that the stone sank 2.77 centimetres in that time, uh, which equates to about one and a half millimetres a year. Um, so again, it doesn't sound very much, but one and a half millimetres every year, um, even just over 100 uh, or in geological terms, a thousand years is nothing. Um, that's quite a lot. Um, they also discovered that the soil moisture had a much bigger um, effect than expected um, and that actually um, they, they kept um, results of um, rainfall um, and found that when it rained and obviously the soil moisture content was um, higher, um, it would cause the soil to expand and actually raise the um, stone, which they hadn't expected it to have such a big effect. Uh, and then in the summer, when um, the soil was generally drier, it would sink um, and kind of accelerate the sinking of the stone. Um, so I think they kind of realised from this that actually um, it's almost impossible to measure really precisely the effects that the worms are having on the stone sinking um, because soil moisture is such having such a big effect, um, which wasn't expected. <laughs> 
Uh, so that kind of brings me to the end of Darwin's experiments. Um, and so if you've enjoyed this and you want to um, find out any more about earthworms, uh, then there will be Kieran's um, talk next week, uh, all about earthworm ecology and the ecological groups. Um, the Earthworm Society of Britain um, has a website, um, Facebook, Twitter, um, and you can become a member if you'd like. Uh, it's only £5 uh, and you can sign up through our website. Um, and on the 21st of October this year, it will be World Earthworm Day. Uh, and there will be lots of posts on our social media and website, um, so keep an eye out for those if you're interested. Um, you can also find out more by reading the book. Um, it's a really interesting book um, and it's very easy to read. Um, I've ploughed through the origin of species, um, which can be quite um, dull and a little bit um, slow at points, um, but the Earthworm book is much more interesting, I think. I'm a little bit biased. Um, but uh, I find it really interesting um, and it's kind of, it's, e it's easy to picture um, Darwin out in his garden doing these experiments and picture what he's doing. Um, because his books are um, all uh, over 100 years ago, they're out of copyright, so um, most of them have been digitised uh, and you can um, download PDF um, copies or text version copies uh, from Darwin Online. Uh, and that's, so the Earthworm book is on there, but also um, most of his other works as well. Um, and then there's also the Darwin Correspondence Project, um, which is run through Cambridge University, uh, and they've basically digitised um, a lot of um, the letters that he wrote to people and also the letters that other people wrote to him. Um, so a lot of the kind of actual observations of the earthworms and of stone sinking and things um, are found, can be found in those letters um, on that website, so it's really useful. Uh, so that's the end of the talk. and. I'm um, happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, yeah, as Kerry said, if you post any questions in the chat, I'll start reading through those now. I know there's a couple already, so I will straight in. There was a question earlier about the Earthworm Charming competition. Amy was asking, can you use watering cans in the competition to encourage them to emerge, do you know? No, you can't. So yeah, really good idea. Um, but no, um, uh, in terms of the um, rules, um, water counts as a chemical. Um, so unfortunately you can't. Let's see. <laughs> it would be seen as cheating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got another question from Amy. She's asking, uh, do you know if earthworms have a symbiosis with mycorrhizal fungi? and help spread them between plant roots? Uh, I don't know, I'm afraid. Um, a lot of the research that's done into earthworms uh, is looking at uh, soil nutrients, um, particularly in agricultural fields. Um, so you might be able to find something about it, um, but I don't know, I'm afraid. No, no, don't worry. We had a question from Alison asking, how do the worms actually pull the leaves in? Uh, uh, so they um, they get them in their mouth. Um, so an earthworm's mouth is called a prostomium, um, and it's basically um, an opening uh, at, at the head end. Uh, and they have um, a kind of fleshy, um, almost a little bit like a um, sort of proboscis or trunk type. Uh, it's not a trunk, but like a little swelling that's a kind of fleshy. Um, sort of prehensile type thing um, and so they can use that to kind of open up and then kind of latch on to um, the leaf or whatever it is um, and then kind of uh, close that against the bottom of their mouth and then drag that way um, and they, they would then move backwards um, into the burrow. Nice. Um, a question from Joe here, he's asking when they bring soil to the surface are they not removing it from lower down? Uh, surprised that this has an overall effect of raising the soil level. Uh, so, so yeah, so it's not necessarily uh, raising the soil level uh, on its own, but it's raising it relative to the stones uh, or the big rock, whatever's in it. So yes, they are bringing it to the surface and they're bringing it from underneath. Um, and then over time, the burrows that they've created in the soil will collapse, um, causing the, the rock to kind of sink down. Um, uh, so to be raised relative to the to the rock. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, we have a question from Louisa asking, are there worms which don't make burrows? Uh, yes, there are. Um, so there's those um, three or four um, ecological groups um, and two of them uh, make burrows, um, but they make very different burrows. Uh, so one of them kind of make horizontal burrows quite um, close to the surface. Uh, the other ones make deep vertical burrows. Um, and then you've got um, earthworms that live in dead wood, uh, in leaf litter, in compost, and those kind of groups, they don't make burrows. They're in quite, um, living in substances that are, that are moving around a lot. Um, but I, I imagine that Kieran will talk a lot more about that kind of stuff um, in his talk next Thursday. Yeah, I think so. Um, Louise asked another question, uh, asking what size brain do worms have and where is it in their body? Uh, so uh, it's it's debatable I, it depends what you count as a brain um, they do have a um, an area uh, in the head um, that has um, uh, brain cells if you like um, so it is they are kind of recognized as having yeah having a brain um, it's in the head uh, I don't know how big it is that will depend on the size of the worm and the species um, relatively small compared to mammals, so. though. Thank you. Um, Stephen's asking, how did Darwin's studies compare with uh, roughly contemporary medical studies in regards to the use of stats in biology? Uh, I think probably not very well. Um, so, uh, I by today's um, statistical standards, um, I don't think I, he would probably struggle to publish some of his results. Um, but I think it's important to remember that at the time, um, nobody else was doing kind of experiments that even thought about repeating things um, and looking at statistics. And so the fact that he was doing it was groundbreaking at the time. But yeah, compared to nowadays, um, it's not that great. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've got a question from you asking, how do earthworms reproduce? Do they rely on their own chemical pheromones like ants to communicate their intent since there's no light beneath the ground? Um, so we don't actually know how they find each other that well. Uh, so they do, uh, they are hermaphrodites and um, so they are um, each individual worm has both male and female um, reproductive organs. Um, but the majority of species, the majority of the time, do need to find a partner to mate with. Uh, and then when they mate, they will both pass on sperm to the partner. So kind of from one mating, you actually get to uh, fertile adults. Um, in terms of how they find their partners, um, I don't know, um, I think it, I, I imagine it is um, chemical, um, whether that's pheromones kind of, I would imagine it's more pheromones um, in a kind of liquid uh, substance uh, released um, in, the, in the soil, uh, rather than kind of a pheromone floating in the air. Oh, and we had a question from Joanne asking, can all earthworms see and smell and do they have eyes? Uh, so no, they don't have eyes uh, and they can't actually um, see. They do have um, light detecting cells. So they are aware, if they come up to the surface, they're aware uh, if it's daytime or nighttime um, and they generally come up at nighttime. Um, and some of them are aware if you then kind of found one at night and shone a light on it, uh, they would often retreat. Um, so they can sense light, but they can't actually see. Um, the main sense that they're using is touch um, and feel. Was there another part to that question? No. <laughs> Next one. Um, Vanessa was asking if you know much about flatworms because her brother thinks he found a blue garden flatworm this morning. Mm -hmm. um, he's also read they don't live in the UK, so just wondering your opinion. Uh, I don't really know much, I'm afraid. Um, there are issues or possible issues with the uh, New Zealand and the Australian flatworms um, which are invasive species um, 
and uh, predators of earthworms, um, predators of the native earthworms. Um, so there is there's kind of ongoing research looking at um, if and how much of an effect um, those two invasive flatworms are having on UK earthworm species. Uh, I don't know anything about a blue garden, is that what it was called? Blue garden flatworm, I'm afraid, um, and I don't really know anything about their life cycles. Um, but I think there was a talk coming up, is there, about flatworms? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got one on 10th of August um, that we'll be looking at non-native flatworms, so it's worth going to that one, Joanne, we'll yeah. help identify it then. Um, we have got a question oh, from Joanne again asking how can earthworms survive when they've been chopped in half? Uh, so um, it depends where they're chopped in half. Um, so if you chop an earthworm in half, you will never get to earthworms surviving. Um, if you chop an earthworm um, kind of towards the tail end, um, basically behind all of the vital organs, then the head end um, with the vital organs uh, probably will survive um, and they have very good um, abilities to regenerate their tails and regrow um, so that end will probably survive the tail end will never grow ahead and survive uh, that will die um, having said that it can um, keep moving for some time um, I've actually seen one that was still moving um, probably a good sort of 16 17 hours after it had been chopped um, I, I couldn't believe it um, but um, so it can keep keep moving um, and it's thought that that probably is a um, defense um, so a kind of distraction to try and get the predator that's chopped them in half to go for the tail uh, and allow the rest of the worm to escape um, but yeah you you never get two earthworms from uh, chopping one in half. <laughs> I've got a question from Joe here he was asking did Darwin's uh, earthworm research contribute to origin of species and his theory of evolution? Well that's good. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't remember him mentioning earthworms in the origin of species um, but I, it's a while since I read it um, and it's probably actually before I was interested in earthworms that I read it so I maybe wouldn't have noticed. I'll have to look that one up. Um, I suspect that I mean, he, so the origin of species was um, his theory came from um, all of the research that he was doing. Um, and it was a very kind of um, broad range of things that he studied. Um, so I suspect that it would have contributed, but maybe not in a kind of direct, obvious way in that he wrote about it in his book. Um, but I think um, his his theory is such a kind of broad theory and involves everything um, that everything he studied probably would have um, uh, helped support his ideas um, and influenced his ideas. Cool, thank you. And we've got a question from Maria asking, is it possible to identify species of earthworms uh, with just a simple microscope or do you need an electron microscope? Uh, no, a simple simple microscope um, is fine. Um, I've actually um, done some uh, just with a um, USB microscope. Um, so you can buy those um, sort of 15, 20 ish pounds online. Um, obviously, the, you kind of get what you pay for. So um, the more that you pay, the better quality it will be. But you can buy um, cheap USB microscopes um, and they are good enough um, for identifying earthworms. Uh, you do need um, you do need a preserved um, earthworm specimen, so you can't identify them live. Um, the identification features are very small, uh, and it's basically all about counting what segments those features are on. Um, and so you need your earthworm to be um, still and not moving in order to be able to count these segments. Um, but you don't need a particularly good quality microscope. Okay. Um, Stephen asks, did Darwin distinguish between different species slash types of earthworms or did he treat them all as one organism? So I find this really interesting um, because, uh, so no is the answer, he treated them all as one, um, which I find quite surprising because he went into such detail about them uh, and we know from all his other studies he went into detail um, about different 
uh, other groups of animals and, and plants. Um, but with earthworms, he uh, he didn't. He never mentions um, a species name, uh, so we don't actually know for definite what species he was looking at. I don't know if he knew how to identify them to species, um, but at the time um, it was known that there were around seven or eight different species in the UK. Uh, now in reality it will it would have probably been about 30 the same as we have now, um, but seven or eight of those species were described and were known at the time in the UK, um, but Darwin never mentions them um, and never attempted uh, from what I've found to never seem to attempt to identify the um, earthworm species, which is very interesting because the different species and the different ecological groups uh, do very different things and live in different places, but he never, never really talked about that. Yeah, I'm really sorry. Yeah, yeah. I've got a question from Elspeth and Ed asking, does the Earthworm Society try and work with farmers to get them to cherish earthworms more? <laughs> um, we do. Um, our, so our main focus um, is on um, recorders uh, and um, getting um, kind of amateur recorders out and sampling. Um, there's, there hasn't been a huge amount of research done into earthworms uh, anywhere, full stop. Um, but the majority of the small amount of research that has been done has been um, agricultural and um, uh, on farmland. Um, so we're kind of, I'm not, I'm not going to say we're not interested in farmland, but we're more interested in um, looking at um, earthworms in woodlands and in other uh, non-farmland habitats. Um, and we found even, so the recording scheme has only kind of been really active for uh, six or seven years now. Uh, and in that time, we've already found that just by getting recorders out and going and looking in different habitats that aren't just agricultural soils, we're changing what we thought we knew about earthworms. Um, so for example, the um, eight or nine years ago, if you'd have asked what is the most common earthworm in the UK, it was one that lives in agricultural soils uh, and already just in the last six or seven years with the recording scheme we found that um, we, we've changed that and the most common species now is not one in agricultural fields even when we take all that agricultural data into account um, so i think agricultural soils are obviously really really important um, for agriculture for our food um, but our focus is more about trying to find out um, earthworms in all different types of soils um, but we are certainly happy to work with farmers um, having said that I don't want to discourage anyone um, and a lot of um, a lot of the um, the kind of research groups um, in the Natural History Museum and also in universities um, in the University of Lancashire there's a, there's a good group there and in Reading um, they're doing a lot of agricultural work. Great thank you uh, Ava, you've got your hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Are you there, Ava? Okay, I might move on to the chat for now. If you do have a question, Ava, pop it in the chat. Um, I can get through those now. Here with me. Okay, we've got a question from Amy asking, what are the main predators of earthworms? Um, Pretty much everything. Um, so obviously uh, birds, um, you've probably all seen birds taking them. Um, foxes, badgers, uh, moles, um, also other invertebrates. Um, so uh, leeches will take them, um, ants, spiders, um, pretty much anything that's not a herbivore will, will have a go at earthworms. Um, and they're very nutritious for them. <laughs> Got a question from Jenny asking, have we learned anything more since Darwin about earthworm in intelligence or consciousness? Uh, I don't know. Um, so I've, I've researched a little bit, um, but I haven't kind of really looked into this that much. Um, but I haven't found anything. Um, so I think kind of since Darwin, um, there was a lot of research um, into these different uh, ecological groups um, that Kieran will talk about next week um, and a, a lot of that research happened um, throughout the uh, 1900s 
Um, so that was kind of seemed to be the main focus. Uh, and then there's been a lot of agricultural research. Um, and I don't think there's been that much um, research on the intelligence, which is, which is really interesting. Um, I would like to look into it more. Yeah, there's lots of <laughs> projects there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a question from Jenny asking, how long have earthworms been around for? Is she right in thinking they were one of the first evolved creatures? Um, yeah, so they're, um, obviously they don't really fossilise very well, so it's limited information, um, but it's thought to be um, around five or six hundred million years. Um, so way, way, way before dinosaurs, um, back in the kind of Cambrian explosion. Um, pretty oh old. Yeah, that's amazing. I didn't realise that. Yeah. Um, Louisa's asking, what's the most common species of earthworm? Uh, so the most common in the UK um, is, um, it's between Lumbricus uh, rubellus, um, which is a species um, that is, seems to be found in all sorts of different habitats. Um, it seems to be a real generalist. Um, Earthworms are really under-recorded, so we don't really know what species live where at the moment. Um, but Lumbricus rubella seems to be found all over. Uh, and then also um, Alolobophora clorotica. Unfortunately, because earthworms aren't very popular, they don't have common names, <laughs> so I have to kind of use the Latin ones. Um, but clorotica is also really common, um, and that's uh, particularly, it's, it's kind of found everywhere, but particularly in disturbed soils uh, and very agricultural. Great. Um, Stephen's asking about earthworm nervous systems and how do they compare with that of mollusks, if you know that. Uh, I have absolutely no idea, I'm afraid. <laughs> That's fine, you're not expected Sorry. to know. <laughs> we'll ask Kieran that one next week, we'll put him on the spot. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was a book um, by Ed Edwards and Lofty, I think, uh, which is all about their biology. Um, so I would try and track down that book um, to find out more. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, we've got a question from Newbie asking, how large is an earthworm's habitat? Do they live out their lives within a square metre or square kilometre, do you know? Um, we don't know. Uh, that, that research hasn't been done. Um, I think that it would depend on the species uh, and which ecological group they live in. Um, so some of them make kind of uh, quite permanent uh, deep vertical burrows and so they will stay in quite a small area. Um, some of the ones that like the kind of really high nutrient things, um, so like your uh, compost, uh, dung, dead wood, um, will stay in that substance. Um, but if that then runs out or dries up, they will then move. And they have quite, um, the research hasn't been done, we don't know, but somehow they're very good at dispersing. So we don't know how they do it. We don't necessarily know how far they can go, um, but somehow they are very good at traveling around and getting to places. So I think in, in kind of bad conditions for the worm where it wants to move and find food, then they can probably move quite a long way. Um, yeah, certainly many metres. Cool. Thank you. Um, we have reached the end of our questions now, I think. I'm just going to scan through and make sure I haven't got anything. Oh, no, there's another one just coming, I think. Uh, one from Lawrence, uh, leading on from that, do you think there's any way of marking individual earthworms to find out how they're dispersing? Um, it's been, so these kind of things have been discussed, I don't, as with most science, it's funding. Um, I don't quite, I, it's not going to be as simple as, um, I don't think you'd be able to mark them in the way that you can uh, mark the wings of a butterfly, for example. Um, I think you'd have to be using some sort of chemical um, trace rather than a sort of physical mark because um, I don't think it would stay on them. Um, I, don't, I, I know that things like this have been kind of discussed uh, in scientific circles. I'm not, I don't think anyone's actually working on it at the moment though, but very interesting. Yeah, there are people making oh different trackers and fluorescent yeah. things that we can use. Yeah. Um, I'm just 
Okay, we'll do one more question, just keep an eye on the time. Uh, Natasha is asking, why do earthworms sometimes crawl across pavements? And should we pop them into the soil if we see them? Uh, so, um, I think generally they are, uh, generally you see them on pavements uh, when it's rain, just after it's rained. Uh, and that's because they've come to the surface with that rain um, because it's kind of safer for them to move. Um, so it might be that they're dispersing to go and find a new uh, habitat to live in, find more food. Um, so that's that's why they're on the surface. In terms of should we move them, uh, yes. Um, obviously it's difficult to know where they're coming from and where they're trying to get to, uh, whether they know that themselves. Um, <laughs> but certainly, uh, on a pavement, they are uh, vulnerable uh, to predators and also vulnerable to drying out, particularly if it's stopped raining or it's dry. Um, so yeah, I would, I would pick them up and move them um, to uh, some grass or some sort of more natural um, habitat, kind of near a near a log or a, in grass or under leaves or something. Um, having said that, when you do see them on a pavement and you when I've picked them up before they're often quite limp and dry already and probably not going to survive anyway um, but but if they're still kind of if they're still quite um, firm um, and, and not kind of really dry feeling they don't stick to you or anything then I think they'll be fine. Yes, yeah, so moving them if we can. Yeah. Got to look out for firm earthworms. <laughs> well brilliant thank you very much for joining us today Kerry. And thanks to everyone else that's joined us. Hope you enjoyed it. And as I said, we will be sending out a feedback email as well. And we'll send around all the links uh, Sophie's just put in the chat now for the Earthworm Society, etc. I'll send that around in the follow-up email and the recording. I think that's about everything. So yes, thank you everyone. And we'll say goodbye now. So hopefully we'll see you all soon.